right, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. My name is Jesse, and if you are joining us for the first time, and I know we have a huge new audience joining us today, especially around Alberta. There's like a gazillion classes around Alberta joining today, so a big welcome to all of you. If you are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through live, free, interactive broadcasts. Everything we do goes to our YouTube channel, so you can check out this program or like 3,000 others for the last seven years, all there when you're done any topic in science and nature imaginable. I'm so excited today too because we are continuing one of my favorite series. In fact, we're wrapping up one of my favorite series, which I will announce in just a second. But first, I want to note for our friends, both live and on YouTube, we are going to have a Kahoot today. The Kahoot's going to be in about 25 minutes, so between the talk and the Q&A portions, you don't need to sign in yet, but if you want to on a separate tab, the game pin is below. I'll make sure to link that into YouTube and our StreamYard groups in just a second. A little fun extra interactivity. Now today, as I said, wraps up uh, our last program with Parks Canada of the Year, specifically in our Peak Discovery series. We have been joined by the amazing folks at Parks Canada's Mountain Parks, Yoho, Kootenay, Jasper, Banff, Waterton Lakes, and more. Over the last few months, it has been such an incredible journey hearing about the animals, the people, the landscapes, the cultures, the history that have uh, been in these parks for literally tens of thousands of years. And we couldn't be wrapping it up in a better way than with our folks today at Waterton Lakes, who are going to talk to us about bison, the guardians of the grasslands. This is an animal that's not only one of the iconic denizens of Canadian wilderness, but also has a huge cultural importance to people that have lived on these lands for thousands and thousands of years. We're going to learn a little bit more about that. We're going to dive in with so much today, really. This is a really spectacular send-off program, and I want to say this is one of our most attended programs ever. We have 2,500 kids signed up for today, so a big welcome to all of you. It is so nice to have you here for our wrap-up to the series. I'm done talking. I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie and Ellie, who are going to blow your minds from Waterton. Thank you both so much for joining us, and let's get underway. <laughs> Hello, bonjour, <laughs> okay. My name is Stephanie, and I'm an interpreter at Waterton Lakes National Park. Hello, bonjour, okay. My name is Anne, and I'm also an interpreter for Waterton Lakes National Park. We acknowledge that we are in the traditional territories of the Six Sigay Stapi, the Blackfoot Confederacy, which consists of the following nations. Kainai, Bagani, Siksika, and Amskapi Bagani. Waterton Lakes Park falls within Treaty 7 territories, which also includes Satina Nation and Stony Nakoda, which consists of Bear Paw, Chiniki, and Good Stony. The Tunaha Nation claim Waterton as their traditional territory, and the Metis Nation Region 3 Association also claim Waterton as being part of their homeland. And the lands and waters of Waterton Lakes National Park have been used for millennia by Indigenous people for sustenance, ceremony, trade, and travel. We thank them for their continuous stewardship and for sharing the land with us. So where are we calling from today? As we mentioned, we are calling from Treaty 7 territory in Alberta, Canada. Along the Rocky Mountains is where you will find Waterton Lakes National Park. Today we are exploring guardians of the grasslands and learning about the ways that bison were and are important to the cultural and natural history of our national park. Be sure to share your questions in the chat as we go along and pay attention because I think there might be a quiz. <laughs> but first, we have a question for the classrooms. Have you ever seen a bison? If so, where was it? And could you describe what it looked like? Let's get three classrooms to answer. All right, so YouTubers, we've got Mr. Edwards' class in Fort McLeod, Alberta, Miss Ken's class in Red Deer. We've got, uh, geez, Miss Knapp's class in Corpus Christi School. Welcome in on YouTube, folks. So many groups joining on YouTube, more than I can actually bring in in this broadcast uh, to highlight right now, plus our StreamYard classes. So if you want to let us know if you've seen a bison, whereabouts, I'll say that I've seen a bison in Elk Island National Park, uh, just a little bit east of Edmonton. They are huge. I can't believe how big an animal a bison is when you see it up close and not in a zoo. Like, you just drive along and see this incredible creature rooting through the snow was wild. Um, our comments are coming in. Connor and Miss Brown's group, yes, on the farm, on their farm. That's pretty <laughs> small. So you need to go to a national park and just head to the farm. Um, some of 4L and Maddie, uh, Maddie McCullough School, Miss Lamb's class, they've seen bison in our stream yard groups. Geez, on a bison farm in Saskatchewan from our Ferguson crew. So many of you, Miss Doyle's class, if you guys want to chime in really quick. Hi, where have you seen bison? Hi. Huh? Where have I seen a bison? Ah. On my computer. <laughs> well, we're going to get a lot of those today. I'm very excited. Stephanie Ellie, I think those are some great answers. 
<laughs> Let's keep it going. <laughs> nice, guys. All right. Well, Stephanie, wait. Is it bison or is it buffalo? When a biologist talks about this animal, they say bison because that's the scientific name. The full Latin name for plains bison is actually bison, bison, bison. But historically, so many people call them buffalo that it's also correct to say that too. It's Ini. Who's that? I'm Ellie, the Ini. <laughs> In the Blackfoot language, Bison are called Inni. Can everyone say that with me? Inni. Inni. <laughs> <laughs> now you might be thinking, what exactly is an Inni? Who am I? Let's find out. Well, I am a big animal, as you can see here on the photo. And I spend my days eating and eating and eating. And when I get tired from eating grass, I take long naps in the sun. But I'm not a slow animal. Don't even think about underestimating me. I have special split hooves that allow me to run very fast, as fast as the cars driving around your neighborhood, up to 55 kilometers an hour. And because I have hooves, I'm considered an ungulate, just like deer, elk, and moose. Can everyone say that with me? Ungulate. <laughs> <laughs> and what did Ini look like? Well, did you know that we have a cape? <laughs> Not red like Superman's, but our cape refers to the thicker fur on our heads, shoulders, and front legs. The rest of our body is actually sleeker. I also have a big head with horns, which are super useful in the winter as they help me shovel away all the snow so I can eat the grass underneath. I also use my horns to fight predators and protect my friends. And lastly, I also have a fluffy tail. <laughs> this tail is also very useful, especially during the summer, um, when I use it to sweat away bugs. I also use my tail as a way to communicate with others, anim other animals around me. If I've got my tail hanging down, then I'm feeling pretty chill. But if I'm angry, I will raise it like that, as if to say, I'm going to charge. Now that you know a little bit more about Eni, we are going to welcome Dylan Frank, a Blackfoot archaeologist here in Waterton Lakes National Park. He will tell us about the importance of Eni to people, specifically the Blackfoot. So sit tight as we pull up the video. Fantastic, guys. All right. Here we are. Thank you. Welcome to the grasslands of Waterton Lakes National Park. Currently, I'm standing on a hilly area in the park formed by glaciers. On this landform, archaeologists have found drive lanes that the Blackfoot people used to hunt bison. To Blackfoot people, the bison gave them pretty much everything they needed to survive, like food, shelter, and clothing. To catch the bison, people needed to be able to outsmart them. In Waterton, this was done by using the steep hills, like the one I'm standing on, along with small rock barriers called cairns to scare the bison to a certain location where people could easily harvest them. Beside me here is one of those cairns. Instead of just using rocks as we see here, people also stood up tree branches to make the barrier even more scary to the bison, causing them to run where the people wanted them to. Lots of these cairns were needed to have a successful hunt, so people placed them all over the tops of the hills like you can see here. As we find more cairns, we can continue to paint the picture of how people and bison interacted in the landscape of Waterton. In our park, we think these drive lanes were used to push the bison over a steep cliff called the buffalo jump. Other ways to hunt the animals would have been to run them into a pond where they would get stuck in the mud. Another technique would be to use a bison pound. These almost look like the horse corrals that you see today but they would have had people hiding on each side of the structure to jump out and attack the animals once they were all gathered together. Now, you might be asking, how did the Blackfoot hunt and harvest the bison? Arrowheads, dart points, and spear points were some of the main tools used to put the bison down once they had them in an easy location to shoot. These photos show some of the things we've actually found right here in Waterton. The bigger the projectile point, the older it generally is. The biggest ones were put on the end of a spear, 
So a person had to use their strength to be effective. The middle-sized ones, the dart points, were used on the atlatl. An atlatl was a tool used to throw a dart, which often looked like smaller spears, a lot faster because of the extra momentum you could gain. The smallest of them all, the arrowhead, was used with a bow and arrow. These were much easier to carry around and they still packed the same amount of punch as the other projectile points, so people used these instead of the other methods. These tools were extremely important because they allowed for such a large animal to be taken down by us, much smaller humans. Once the animal went down, the meat and hides had to be dried, smoked, or cooked within a few days to prevent them from spoiling. Sometimes people would work all night and day just to get this done, which required lots of help. To do this as fast as possible, entire communities would join in. Tools like knives, scrapers, choppers, and mauls were used in this part of the hunt since they could break down each different body part without destroying it. Just how important is the bison? Borrowing a line from our friends at the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center in Montana. What do you do with a 2,000 pound bison? You can eat it, wear it, live in it, and build a whole culture around it. These are just some examples of how the Blackfoot use the different parts of the Eni. Ellie is going to help me describe just how important she is to the Blackfoot. Oh yes, I love being told how important I am. Where to begin? Well, let's begin with my cape. Not only does it keep me warm, but it also keeps people warm throughout chilly Canadian winters. Here. And here is an example of what a bison robe may look like. This right here is a real bison robe. The Blackfoot also sometimes remove the fur and use the hide for shoes and toys and also making teepees. You can make so much out of my fur. Something else that is useful are my horns. Ooh, ooh, that always make my head ring. Yep, that's right. These horns can be used to make all sorts of things. Let's ask the classrooms. What do you think the horns could be used for? List it out in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. So YouTubers can chime in. A StreamYard class, we'd love to hear from you. Bison horns, what could they be used for? My first mental picture here goes to like a cornucopia, but that's just because I grew up with lots of Thanksgiving imagery. We can put some stuff in that. I'm not sure if they were actually used for that at all. Uh, probably not, but uh, let's check YouTubers and see what people are coming in for. StreamYard, if you want to join in uh, too, we'd love to hear you go. Tools and weapons from Mr. Edwards class, cups from his lambs class, uh, tools, necklaces we've got. Holy, you guys are the best audience ever. Spears, knives, tools from Mr. Ferguson, or the Ferguson class in Regina. Uh, YouTubers, holy, musical horn, thank you. Ms. Grant's <laughs> got tools, arrows. Tools and arrows and weapons are sort of our, our abiding answers here. So great job, guys. Awesome, yeah, thank you for all those answers. And exactly, the horns are hollow and make great cups and containers and can be carved to make utensils like this spoon. Another part of the bison that makes great tools are the bones. So this scraper is made of bone and is used to scrape fat and sinew off bison hide. Bones can also be made into needles, which are used for sewing clothes. Wow, my bones are super cool. Yes, they are really cool. And there's one more thing that is very useful to the Blackfoot. Oh, I almost forgot. Where did that go? Oh, right here. I must have misplaced it. Show of hands. Who thinks they know what this is? I think so. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I want to say. I think the kids are, we've got some good reactions in the background of the classes that I can see with our StreamYard classes. If anyone wants to chime in, Miss Doyle's class, do you want to wait? Do you want to come in? What do you think it is? You can unmute. What do we think? Okay, go ahead. What do you think it is? Say it. It looks like a pie. A pie? <laughs> I think they might be honest. I heard brain in the background, though. I like where the people's minds are going here. Brain or pie? <laughs> well, some of you guessed it. 
it's scat, which is a fancy term for poop. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. Yuck, yuck. But let me tell you, Amy's scat isn't smelly and is actually quite clean. Otherwise, I wouldn't be holding it. And especially when it dries out, it has no smell to it at all. One of the many gifts of the Eni to the Blackfoot is scat. It is great for starting fires, which is used for cooking and ceremony. The Blackfoot also intentionally started fires on the land to help the Eni. Starting fires? Yikes, I really don't like fires. Although fires tend to scare away the Eni, fires actually help the grass grow big and tall. So when the fire was put out, the grass would grow so much faster and attract more Eni to the area. I do love a good healthy patch of grass. The Blackfoot really take care of us Eni. But my question is, where did all the Eni go? I once heard that there used to be millions of us roaming the land, up to 60 million. Well, when settlers started to colonize or move west, they wanted to create room for their own farms and towns. One thing getting in the way of this was that this land was already home to many indigenous peoples, like the Blackfoot, and millions of bison that roamed the landscapes of the Great Plains. As we just mentioned, Indigenous people used bison for everything in their lives. So the settlers came up with a plan to remove the bison in order to remove the people. Unfortunately, their plan worked as Indigenous peoples were forced to move to smaller pieces of land which lacked food and other resources. The arrival of the settlers led to the bison being killed for their thick hides to use for clothing and strong machine belts in factories for their bones to be used in fertilizer and ammunition, and also just for sport, which nearly caused the giant animal to go extinct. That's awful. Well, not all is lost. We are doing our best to bring back the Eni. What over the last 100 years, organizations across North America put their minds together to find ways to build up the numbers again. And Parks Canada is taking part in this. Before the Keenau wildfire, a herd of 10 bison called the park home before having to be evacuated to local herds. In February 2021, six bison were brought to the park from Elk Island National Park to start the herd anew and they are currently thriving. Actually, Ellie, would you like to tell us a little bit about the projects being done on the ED in Waterton Lakes National Park? Of course. Well, the park scientists are currently working with other national parks like Banff and Elk Island to analyze loads of parasites we might be carrying. Um, they're also monitoring our diet and to see if my cousins from Elk Island might be eating different foods and in different quantities. Finally, they're looking to see how many herbivores can live in Waterton Lakes National Park without overeating the plants or vegetation. Maybe I can have some friends come over if there's enough food for all of us. How many Eni are currently in the paddock? Mm, right now, there are 14 of us, six adults, two two-year-olds and six young of last year. And we might expect new calves anytime now. That's so great to hear. Oh, Stephanie, you got me all excited, excited about having new friends over. Did you hear anything about that? Well, Waterton Lakes National Park is part of the Eni Initiative, which is an indigenous led project to restore free ranging bison across their historical range. The Blackfeet Reservation in Montana plans to release bison currently held in captivity. This would allow bison to range freely into Glacier National Park and Waterton Lakes National Park. Of course, this would spark questions about free-ranging bison management and what happens with the ones in the paddock here in Waterton. So this is still all in discussion and we're still unsure about this idea still. But Stephanie, by the way, we're talking about the future. But why did you bring us back in the first place? Good question. The other reason for bringing bison back in is wildlife conservation. In our national parks, 
we have a guiding principle called ecological integrity. Basically, that means that we are always trying to make sure that our ecosystems are healthy and whole. We realized that our ecosystem was missing a very important large piece. North America's largest land mammal, the plains bison. We like to call bison ecosystem engineers because they do so much to change their environment and make it richer for other species. They do this in a few main ways what they eat, how they move, who they feed, and what they poop out. <laughs> but because bison are living inside a fenced area, the use of habitat is not naturally spread out. However, we do still see how the eni benefit the land, even if it is on a, a smaller scale. For example, Bison create wallows, which are depressions in the ground. Mm. This creates microclimates and the bison scat enriches the soil. They also have relationships with birds that will eat bugs on bison fur. Wow, I didn't realize I was so important. Yes, you are important. <laughs> Why don't you share some other cool facts about bison? Like what do bison eat? Oh, we eat grasses and plants. Oh, I see. So you're a herbivore. Oh, yes. And how do bison move? Well, we roam large areas in search of good meadows to graze and churn up the ground with our sharp hooves and heavy footsteps. We use our horns to rub bark off trees and push them over to create bigger meadows. We roll on the ground and carve out wallows in the dirt. We clear snow from meadows in the winter using our massive heads like shovels. All these actions change the landscape around us. And who do bison feed? Bison are a prey for other species, but they're also tough and large and difficult to hunt. It's almost impossible to catch a healthy adult bison, but very young, very old, sick, or injured bison can be caught and eaten by wolves, cougars, and bears. That can mean up to one ton of bison tea. So let's not forget that it's not just the hunters that get a meal from an animal that big, but plenty of scavengers too, like uh, ravens, crows, coyotes, wolverines, bugs, and even bacteria. And what do Bison poop out. <laughs> oh, lots of poop. Each adult bison in our herd can make around 15 to 20 kilograms, so about 30 to 40 pounds of poop every day. That waste is full of good stuff. Fiber, plant seeds, and moisture are all useful to the grasslands. Bison droppings recycle nutrients and grow even more delicious plants. The poo provides a home for a whole bunch of bugs as well. To explore these ecological relationships, we are going to play one of my favorite games. I like to call it the Wheel of Bison! Woo! <laughs> we are going to spin the Wheel of Bison, and whatever species we land on, that species has a connection to bison somehow. I have already given a few clues. So if you have an idea of what the answer might be, write it in the chat and I will give you just a quick moment for you to think and then we will reveal the answer. Ready? Yay, spinning the wheel. <laughs> Whoa, we landed on the dung beetle. All right, so you can type in the chat what you think the relationship with the dung beetle and the bison is. Ooh, okay, dung beetle. I think I, we, we had the kids pretty quickly identify dung last time. You you didn't get the YouTube amount of poop answers. So I think our dung beetle friends are going to be pretty good on this. But be quick on the trigger figure. Our furs in class lives in the dung. So the dung beetle inside the dung of the bison. You're just hanging out there. Nice little home. Digs himself a little place to live. Uh, any other comments coming in? Eats the dung. So, okay, I think they're on the ball here. They're they're. They're hanging awesome. out around and <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for those answers. So bison patties are home to many different types of bugs, including dung beetles. These bugs break down and, and distribute the dung to fertilize the grasses that bison feed on. 
May I turn the wheel again? Yes, you can go again. All right. Uh, okay, what is that? Oh, we have the wolf. wolf. So, bison, what do you think oh. is the relationship between the wolf and the bison? <laughs> You can tell us if you want, but I think can eat bison. They're definitely not living in the dung. I think we've established we can establish that firmly that the dung beetle got their own little leash going on. But eating bison, uh, yeah, everyone's on there. They are absolutely they're taking down the bison. I love it. That's awesome. Good job, everyone. So bison, usually the old, sick, or very young, are food for wolf packs. Grasslands that are created by bison also attract other types of prey for wolves. Let's spin it again. One more spin. Yay. Whew. I'm excited. Oh, what do we got? Oh, what's that guy? What is that guy? <laughs> Whoa. I think we have the B. All oh, right. Type in your answers in the chat. Hmm. What does a B have to do with Bison, I wonder. Let's see. You guys have been, by the way, can I just say while we're waiting for people to type in the chat, this has been like the most engaged audience ever. So especially to our like horde of Albertans, way to go. But everybody all across Canada, the US beyond, we had a class in Kenya sign up for today, which is amazing. So really appreciate all your enthusiasm, everybody. Bison spread seeds and bees like that via their scat. So just uh, hanging out in the poo in some fashion, maybe getting some seeds to help pollinate some things. I like these answers. Anyone else chiming in on YouTube? Let's see. Poop fertilizes flowers that bees draw upon. So we got the flower angle here for bison as our last wheel. Awesome. Thank you for all those answers. All right. So bison grazing, wallowing, and tree rubbing opens up new grassland and opens up the canopy, allowing for flowers, aka food for bees, to grow more freely. Wallowing also helps flowers to grow by breaking up seed pods and dispersing them in freshly broken up prairie soil. Do we have time for one last spin? We can spin one more time. We can do whatever we want. This is our program, okay? All right, all right. One more time. One last spin, maybe. Elk? We got the elk. All right. Last but not least, the elk. If you want to tell us what the elk can do, we've had so many people chime in, but we can dive in with this. And I do like how you, you that was a very natural spin with the whole pulling it. <laughs> very, very good. Subtle. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they, how are the elk related to our bison friends? So elk benefit from the expanded grasslands created by bison. They fill a slightly different ecological niche and graze at different grass heights than bison do. All right. Awesome. <laughs> so thank you so much for playing with us. In conclusion, whether you're as big as a bear or small as a butterfly, Bison really do make your life better. And if you can visit us, you can see a bison herd in action at our bison paddock. We have a driving loop for you to view the bison from the safety of your car and the Elliot person. Now it's time to see what questions you have for us. Huh, Stephanie, Ellie, the Innie, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for an incredibly engaging and fun program. Audience, you guys have been amazing. We are going to dive with the interactive bit now. So I'm going to start with our Kahoot. Uh, for those who might be new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Now, you don't win anything, but you do win Ellie, the Innie's everlasting respect, which I think is worth it. <laughs> Um, there's such a big audience today. I'm kind of hoping we can break the all-time Kahoot record for our last Peak Discovery series. So I'm going to leave that game pin up for a minute. You guys can come on in and join us. Um, the more, the merrier. We'd love to have you all in. Uh, you can sign in on separate devices. And we are going to get underway momentarily. There'll be a leaderboard at the end. Let us know who you are if you are one of these folks by the end. And then we are going to go to uh, Miss Mustard's class for our first question in just a minute. We've already got some great questions coming in on YouTube as well. I'm going to get underway with this. We've already got 85 and more. Uh, keep them coming. Keep joining in, everybody. Let's get underway and start this thing. Here we go. All right. Over 105 at last check. More coming in. You got time. Better, better, better. This is great. Three, two, one. We're going to dive in. If you want to help us out, Ellie and Stephanie, before everything comes to an end, you can help us with all these questions. Bison are the largest land animal in North America. True or false? 
Maybe I'm tricking you with this giant picture of a bison right up close and center. Maybe it's true. I don't know. We're going to find out. What do you think? Over 100 answers so far. Keep them coming. Five more seconds. I mean, Ellie's a pretty big innie. I mean, Stephanie's a little bigger, but I don't know. <laughs> 99 of you got this right. The answer is true. So, yes, way to go. Bigger than polar bears, bigger than teeth ears, bigger than all the other cool stuff we got going on in the continent. Charming elk takes our lead. I hope that we get an elk or a bison name that wins. That has happened for me once ever. That's our secret goal. All right, question two. Quiz. Which of these are the words are bison in the Blackfoot language? And I'll give you a hint. We've said it 74 times over the course of the broadcast. Is it buffalo? <laughs> is it any? Is it yak? Or is it pita? What do we think? The, the, our bison's like, he's kind of curious. He's like, what, what am I? Who am I? It's a quizzical face in the Kahoot picture. 140 of you in, way to go. Okay, our answer is, of course. Let's see. Any 112 you got this right. A few of you are quick on the draw with buffalo. Another term for them, but the Blackfoot language was our key there. So we are going to go to question three. What's our leaderboard? Oh, great. And Palad takes our lead barely over trying elk. We got we're in the antelope family still. It's very exciting. All right. How many bison are currently in Waterton this year? Is it six, 10, 14, or 20? This is like a the most tight knit group of answers we've ever had. Usually you'd be like one, a thousand, 10 million. But today we're keeping you on your toes. We're, we're, we want you to really have paid attention at the end there. Three more seconds. Get those answers in, everybody. <coughs> 14 is correct. 92 of you got that right. You're killing it. Okay. I'll note that we go into our next two questions. Uh, there is no right answer for these, but we'd love to hear from you what your answer is because this has been part of the fun of the Peak Discovery Series. Did you learn something today that you didn't know before? Did you learn a lot? Did you learn a little bit? Or... Are you an any yourself and you didn't learn anything because you actually are a bison and you didn't need to know anything today? You're like, why am I here as a bison in the back of a classroom? I mean, we do have a lot of Alberta classes that apparently have seen bison like everywhere. So maybe, let's see. What do we think? Most of you learned a lot. That's fantastic. And we had 33 bison in the program. So that's exciting too, that they snuck in to watch. That's wonderful. Um, let's go to our, our final question. Then we'll check our leaderboard together. I'm going to questions right after that. Did you like today? And you don't, if you didn't like it, there's no penalty. If you, I, hope <laughs> you I really liked it. Did you love it? Did you like it? Are you kind of neutral? Or were you like the sad face that I found when I had very much fun finding emoticon pictures? <laughs> now, this bison looks kind of sad, but I also could be trying to butter you up by showing you like a young bison, in which case I find that very exciting. Let's see. Hopefully lots of likes and loves. Yes, I, that's the breakdown you want, really. Mostly love. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, folks, thank you all so much for joining today. Let's check our podium, and then we are ready to Miss Mustard in Brampton for our first question. Stellar Sphinx is in third. Second place, Great Impala. Did our elk friend win? And if you are these people, let us know who you are. We'd love to hear from you in the chat. Number one, Charming Elk, almost wire to wire. Way to go, uh, everyone. Thanks for participating in that. Um, and we're going to dive in with questions. So, Miss Mustard's class, I'm going to come to you first. If you have questions for Stephanie, Ellie, or we've got Dylan from our video in the background as well. If you need any guest expert super knowledge today, Dylan is like the best person to have in the background of all time as he grins ear to ear for like 40 <laughs> minutes. So, thank you for being an awesome background guy, Dylan. Um, I'm going to head to Miss Mustard's class. Come on in, guys. And take us away. Thank you for watching. Yeah. Okay. okay, who has a question? No? Okay. Uh, go ahead, Sierra. Um, hi. Is if, a, if a bison loses its swim, will it grow back or will it be fat, like still be as fast? If it, <laughs> if it, if it's losing its tail? It's no, like if it loses its, like, any of its limbs, will it still like a be limb. as fat? It's a three-legged bison. Will it be as fat? Will it grow it back? That would be cool. I like that. Well, <laughs> I don't have that ability. I am not growing back my limbs. Rats. And it's the same as for you. Do you think if you try to run with one leg, will you be as fast as with your two legs? Mm, I don't no, think no, so. I will say though, for our kids that are keen, there are actually animals that could regrow limbs and it's super freaky, but the mammals are not among them, sadly. No. It's not one of our cool party tricks that we can do yet. 
Maybe one day with cool science. Um, Miss Martell's class, I'm heading to you guys next, and then I'm going to take a couple of YouTubers, Miss Doyle and our Ferguson crew, and coming to you after that. Miss Martell, grade fives. Hi, guys. Hey. 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 Yeah. Hey, ask how long have bison been around? Ooh, how long have they been around? <laughs> Uh, they might have, we're not entirely sure about like exact timeline, but they might have been for, around for at least 10,000 years. Yeah, so we've been interacting with them for 10,000 years. I'm trying to look up their evolution and when they appear on the landscape. I can try and get an answer for that because we do have a, we, I mean, we have fossil records of a lot of big of the mammals in, in North America and beyond. Mm -hmm. So I'll track that down for us. Dylan, uh, while you're here, do you happen to know how long bison have been in the ground generally? Uh, I don't know the specific number, but I know people have been around North America for at least 10,000 years and people have been hunting bison. So 10,000 years is a pretty good number that we could sure. probably say confidently. <laughs> nice, guys. Um, I'm going to head to our YouTubers for just a second. Let's see so many questions on YouTube. It's amazing. Okay. Uh, let's see for our first one, some of our best classes here. Miss McKinney's class, welcome in in Edmonton. They want to know from Elijah, how fast can bison run? Stephanie and Ellie, how fast can you run, Ellie? I can run as fast as 55 or 60 kilometers an hour. Fantastic. Yep. And then our question, this is a rapid fire round. Mr. Edwards' class, our Fort McLeod crew, how many bison are in Alberta total? We talked about water to lakes. Do we have a sense of how many in the province right now? Um, I don't have an exact number of in Alberta, but in uh, Canada, we do have around 2,000 plains bison, and there's also 11,000 plain bison, uh, that are sorry, wood buffalo, or wood bison. <laughs> Dylan, any extra on that? You know, uh, From what Stephanie said, there's also a lot of uh, bison herds that people farm with, so yes. those probably increase the numbers quite a bit, too. We've been getting so many of our classes today either are on bison farms or know them or that's where they've seen bison for the first time. So I'm really glad we're getting that perspective today from our audience. So thank you, guys. Uh, let's head to Ms. Doyle's class. If you guys want to unmute your mic, uh, turn on camera, same with our Ferguson crew, Regina. Uh, I'll pop in and check in with you guys the moment you have your devices on so they can take questions. In the meantime, uh, Mr. Bode's class, can their horns grow back? Uh, we, we've established limbs are not going back, but can the horns fall off and grow back sort of like deer can or not? So no, that would be the difference between antlers and horns. Uh, antlers that you will find on moose, elk or caribou, these, uh, these fall off and grow every year, but horns are here to stay for the whole life. So for us, bison, and it's the same for sheep or goat, anything yeah. called a horn will not grow back. Fantastic. Um, I did just find out about bison evolution. So they've been in North America for about 200,000 years. They arrived there from Asia. They crossed the same land bridge that people did from Asia, and they evolved around 2.6 million years ago. So they actually are a fairly recent species in world history, and they're quite recent in North America as well. They beat us here by 100 and something thousand years, but we've been interacting with them for at least 10,000. Great nuance to the question, everybody. Miss Doyle's class, unmute your mic. Come on in. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Well, we'll hear you more when the mics are muted. More fun that way. Hi. Oh, hello. hello. You have a question for us today. Okay. What's that question? Well, think you have a question? No. I would like to show you that. Uh, no, does anyone have a question? Um. Any what? questions? Oh, is that uh, a question? Do you like the dice I organized? Yeah, not that kind of question, guys. We will come back to you if you do have any questions for us, okay? Uh, our Ferguson crew, Regina, if you guys want to unmute your mic, welcome to the Hey. Um, so, on. like, how does bison taste? How does bison taste? <laughs> well, have you? This one, honestly, how do bison taste for our folks that might eat bison? Um, you want to chime in? I, I personally have never eaten <laughs> one of my own. <laughs> Stephanie, we don't. Um, maybe you've had a burger. <laughs> oh, I have tried bison burger, and I would say it is kind of similar to beef, but that was just me. Dylan, <laughs> uh, have you had bison? Yes, I have, and maybe don't tell Ellie, but I love bison. It tastes delicious. <laughs> <laughs> 
for our for our farming yeah Ellie, close your ears for our farming crews uh yeah bison is, is farmed for its meat all over canada and beyond um and you can regularly find it at a lot of restaurants nowadays actually which wasn't really the case when i was younger near as much so i'm actually glad we got that question thanks guys <laughs> Let's head to YouTube for a few, and then we'll come back to some of our classes uh, for a few more. We've got five more minutes. Let's see. Um, oh, Mr. Everett's class, what are bison related to? I'm going to bring in everybody all at once here. Do bison have any close relatives in the animal kingdom? Uh, they're pretty close to cows, I would think, because they're both grazing animals, and they're both pretty large. <laughs> there you go. So, Ellie, you're close to a cow. We didn't know, but I'm now you know. <laughs> and two other ungulates with split hooves as well. Yes. So there's lots of animals in the two-footed hoof or two-hoof um, group. Uh, even toed ungulates are a very, very common group of animals. We find them in East Africa. We find them in Asia. We find them across North America. So it's one of the most common of all the groups of mammals on Earth. So I really like that question, guys. All right. Let's take a couple more from YouTube, and then we're going to head back to our live classes. Miss Knapp's class, and I'm so sorry you couldn't come in on YouTube or StreamYard today, Miss Knapp's class, that that didn't work. But they do want to know on YouTube, what's the lifespan of a bison? Stephanie and Ellie. Yeah, so the lifespan is generally between 10 and 20 years. Um, so it's still a pretty long time. And I will just add that usually for birth, it's usually so that there's usually the same amount of male and females being born, but then male bison will engage in more in more uh, fighting and dangerous activities. So um, they tend to die a bit more than females. Uh, we'll take one rapid fire question, then one for you, Dylan, in a minute. Then we're going to go to our live classes. We might go a little long today because we're rebels together, but that's half the fun. Miss Arsenault's class wants to know, do they only have one baby? How many offspring do bison have? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yes, it will be one, one baby a year. And the gestation period for a female bison, like, like, me, Ellie, the Eni, is roughly nine months, so about the same time as us um, humans. And the baby will be born around May, June. Um, but you could also get surprise baby later in the season, like we did here last year in Waterton Lakes National Park. We got a baby in September. So it all depends on, on, on like, depending on environmental conditions as well. Yeah. But. That's actually very common in the animal kingdom is when you have uh, sort of better conditions or the best possible conditions, animals will have extra babies to account for that. Um, so I'm really glad we got that answer. Thank you, too. Dylan, this one's specifically for you. Uh, O'Burn Claus wants to know, are Blackfoot people still allowed to go harvest bison in the wild? Uh, well, there's not a lot of wild bison. I don't think that I know of any. But we are working at uh, Parks Canada. There has been cases where there has been bison allowed to be harvested through special permits and a lot of organizing, but we are hoping to allow Indigenous people to access them more, just like they did in the past. Right. This is something that we're starting to see in Canada and around the world, actually, sort of a, a two-tiered or a multiple system of conservation, sort of recognizing the fact that Indigenous communities have been on the land for thousands and thousands of years and have not radically depleted wildlife stocks and animals, as opposed to what we showed in that really to, you know, the, the bison skull pictures with railroads in the West, as we colonize the West, are some of the most disturbing pictures in the history of sort of wildlife colonization. Um, and so with that different approach, it's really important to start sort of accounting for this. And as these populations recover, allowing for things like this. We see this in indigenous or Inuit communities in the North in terms of the seals and, and bears and whales that they're allowed to harvest. And I'm, I'm really glad we got that question from our old bird group. So thank you for that, Dylan. Um, we're going to head back to our live classes. We've got Miss Mustard's class. They can wrap us up with one final question if you'd like. Come on in. Take us away. Hey, four fives. Is there a particular name for like a bison who's a female, like a female bison? Is there like a particular name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like yeah, that. Good question. So we somebody asked the question, like, what other animal that we all know yeah. I could be related to? So that's it. That's the name of a female is a cow. Yeah. Okay. And so the male would be the bull and the baby, the calf. So that's it. Same name as us for cow, cow, bull, calf. And then in Blackfoot, I mean, we talked about any, of course, throughout the broadcast. Most of our kids got that right. Um, is there a special term for female bison? Uh, not, that, not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair answer. Um, 
Dylan, Stephanie, Ellie, this has been such a fun program. I know we could go all day. There are already more questions on YouTube than I can possibly answer in one broadcast. So what I'm going to do is encourage you. If you have any additional questions, if our amazing team at Waterton Lakes is willing to take them, you have our email address at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants. We can connect you with the folks there to ask any more of your questions. Check out their website. Waterton Lakes has a great deal of education resources. Parks Canada in general has done an amazing job in highlighting the role of bison, both uh, as a cultural heritage animal and a, as one that's essential to the landscapes. So you can find out a ton more about them there. And of course, if you want to check out our entire Peak Discovery series, check out the link below. They're all on YouTube for you to check out after this broadcast is done. And it has been such a thrill over the last few months getting to hang out with all of you. Honestly, one of my most fun uh, series I've ever had the chance to be a part of. So Dylan, Stephanie, Ellie, we'll wrap up there. I'll bring in Miss Mustard's class to say a big thank you and farewell. And you guys stick around when we're done. Bye, Miss Mustard's class.